and sing with us. Would you mind standing? Let's sing that song. That's got me in the spirit of singing. I can't lead the music, but y'all God with me. Let's sing it out. Ten, uh, take it away there, Kelly. Here we go. Ready? I'm going to take, I'm gonna take Daniel's job. You ready? Take it away. I do a good job of leading you into that. Amen. Better watch out, Daniel. I feel it coming on. <laughs> Amen. Very good. I love that song. That just gets you in the spirit of serving the Lord and Amen. going to heaven when you die. And this world is not our home. Look, the world is not our friend. The world is not our friend. God is our friend. Amen. 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 Let's pray and ask him to bless. Lord, thank you so much that we have a blessed hope, that we're not uh, residents of this land. We have a home in heaven, Lord. And thank you so much that we're just pilgrims passing through. And Lord, this is a song of reminding us that we have a home waiting on us. And so I pray you'd help us to live like we're just pilgrims and strangers and just passing through and looking for that city that's builder and maker is God. What a city, what a city that we look for. Lord, where eyes, our eyes are on you this evening. Thank you for the sweet spirit of God that's been in this place uh, most all day, it seems, just moving and working and guiding and leading us. Lord, and we just worship you now, glorify you. Thank you for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we may just be passing through, but while we're here, we've got a job to do. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. Sing with me now. Rescue the perishing. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the Blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Put your voice to sing this great old hymn of the faith. Come, thou fount, come, thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy, never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, some thy praise.
choir is going to sing for us now, He's Still Working on Me. Thank you, choir. There we are. Aren't you glad that he's not done working on you? If this is the best, if this is all you were ever going to be, that'd be pretty sad. But he's not done. The Bible says, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for that. Thank you, choir. All right, just a few things by way of announcement wanted to bring to your attention. Don't forget, if you've got a graduate in your family this year, make sure you catch Miss Brittany Cheatham at some point and get the form from her to fill out so we can recognize your graduate on May the 19th. Music ministry meeting on April the 21st, right after the morning service. I cannot stress how important this is. This is a very, very important meeting that Pastor wants to have with us just to, to, to go over a few things and get everybody on the same page. And just every once in a while, it's good to circle the wagons Get everything in order, so that way we can um, proceed and, and uh, worship the Lord in, in the way that we ought to. So that'll be right after the morning service on the 21st. Our business luncheon, it is this week, coming up here on Tuesday, April the 18th, 11 o'clock to 1 p.m. That'll be right here at the church in the Fellowship Hall. We'll have business owners from all over. It's not Tuesday, Thursday, sorry. Thursday, I'm rushing it. Thursday, April the 18th, we will have business owners from all over Claiborne County and the surrounding areas here at our facilities. And uh, what an honor it is to, to host them. We'll have Bob Kessling here to speak. And uh, just pray, if you would, that um, it'll be a good, a good event, that everything that's said and done will bring, bring glory to God, and that we'll be an encouragement to our local business owners um, that, that we have contact with on a daily basis. Lydia Ladies is also that same Thursday evening, 6.30 in the evening. There's details in the bulletin on where that will be, um, but that is also that same April the 18th. Don't forget our men's morning meeting here at the church on Wednesday, the 17th. Then coming up on April the 21st, in addition to our music ministry meeting, our fried chicken dinner. We are so excited and looking forward to that. Um, that'll be right after the morning service. There is a sign-up sheet on the foyer table if you've not signed up to bring a side dish or whatnot, that is available out there for you. We also have our nursing home ministry will be um, that afternoon at 2 if you're interested in helping out with that. See Brother Ray Knuckles. And then our spring revival also, we got a lot going on on the 21st. Brother Brian McBride will be with us Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evening. So mark your calendars for that. Um, he'll be preaching for us. We'll have some groups from here. The, the area that will be singing for us, our choir will be singing every night, 
Um, we'll have a meal at 5.30 on Monday through Wednesday, and then the revival service will start at 7 on those evenings. So a lot, a lot going on starting on the 21st. And then our Car Maintenance and Mechanics Day, April the 27th, meeting here at the church that Saturday morning. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. I know we've got several that have. Something right there. This is a good idea. If you had know somebody, this is brought to my attention today, it was a great idea. If there is somebody you know that their car needs maintenance, if you know a older person or somebody that needs tires rotated or oil changed or whatever, please let us know because we want to take that car to there and there'll be somebody that knows what they're doing. So we, we, we won't let children change their tires and not tighten a lug nut. So <laughs> it will be oversight, oversight of us. Watch it, but... Uh, overseen <laughs> uh, so uh so if you know somebody that needs a car looked at let us know yes get us get us their name their number we'll make sure they're they're aware of that but that is for sixth grade boys and girls and up so starting at sixth grade and, and older boys and girls are available if you have any questions about that see brother kevin gibson or kevin wiley on that and then thursday tuesday april the 30th is our girls and ladies paint class with miss sissy um, hosting that right here at the church, 5.30 to 8 in the evening. That is ages 10 and up. So a lot a lot of things going on here. Excited about it. Amen. Well, our pastor's going to come. He's going to open God's word to us. I hope you came expecting to hear from the Lord tonight because that's exactly what's going to happen. But right before he does, we've got Miss Suzanne Teeter is going to come and sing for us. song just, 
man, when you think about seeing the Lord, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I think about that sometimes. What will it be like when I see him? What will it be like when I see him? I'm convinced that we'll see him as they saw him on the cross. I'm convinced we'll see him as he was on the cross. I don't know. It, it just, I think that's what's going to cause us to fall on our face. The Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I believe when we see him, no one will have to make us bow. I mean, it would just be unbelievable the sight of seeing our Jesus. John said, I saw him. I saw him. Well, if you have your Bibles there, turn with me to 1 John 5. 1 John chapter 5. I appreciate so much the liberty I had this morning to preach. I wish I could express to you. I wish I could relate to you. I wish I could allow you to see what it's like. I wish I could say this at every message, but I can't, honestly. But I know that one man called it when you're hooked up, you know. I don't know if that's the right word. But when God gives leadership and the liberty to say it, there's nothing in the world like it. And I can't express that to you because I know you, most of you have not stood here and been behind uh, and, and preached a message. Or, and, but I would to God... I would to God I could put to words what it's like to know that God himself has given you something to say and you have said it according to his divine will. I'm not always there. I'll just be honest with you. I'm not where I should be in tune with the Lord. But I'll tell you what, when it, uh, when it happens, there's nothing in the world uh, that's more satisfying, that's more, uh, I don't know, I, I just wish I could explain it. Brother Jim said it so clear, you just know. <laughs> uh, you just know. And I knew as well as I was standing here this morning uh, that God was flowing through me like conduit. I, I, and I'm not trying to brag, I'm just saying, I just know it. And uh, I, I, there's just nothing like it. And I guess that's what keeps you driving on. You know, there's times that one man said, uh, I don't always hit a home run. Not every baseball player hits a home run. <laughs> Sometimes you don't even get on base. <laughs> There's been many a time that I've struck out and didn't get on base when it comes to preaching. That may be a bad illustration, but I think you understand what I mean. Uh, but boy, when God feeds it to you and say this, say this, that's, that's sweet. In 1 John chapter 5, there's a truth out of this particular chapter that I want to share with you that God brought to my attention. And it's in 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 1. The scripture says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begotteth love, begetteth love him also that is begotten of him. For this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. We keep his commandments. Verse 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For, whoso for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I'll stop reading there and go back to that verse in verse 3. Uh, there's three words in verse 3. The very last three words are not grievous. And I want to preach this thought to you, not grievous. The Christian life, in my opinion, is the easiest life to live. When you compare it to the life you had before Christ, it is the easiest life. Although living and dying to self is tough, people say, oh, the Christian life is too hard to live. Yes, when you don't die to self, it's very hard because your flesh is always winning. Your flesh is always capitalizing on your 
shortcomings and your besetting sins and the flesh is always there. Satan's always there to knock you down and keep you down and push you down and, 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 and keep you in that place. But when we're in tune with the Lord and we keep short accounts with Him and we're doing our part as a Christian in keeping His commandments, it's not grievous. And one of the evidences I think I can speak to you tonight on this subject is when you're in tune with Him, when things are just not working out, when things are just not coming together, when the stars are not lining up, when things are just on every turn, there's a door shut and a, an, an opportunity closed. And on every opportunity, I mean, you're trying to force it. You're trying to push it. You're trying to make it. You're trying to create it. You're trying to always grind it out. It could just be that's not God's will. I'm not always saying the things God is allowing us to do are easy. But I do know this. In God's great work, when he's moving you forward in his will, though it may be uphill, there will be some stability. There will be peace in that. If you're searching God's mind about things and you're searching God's wisdom about things, uh, it, it will not be grievous. God will not play jokes with you. God will not withhold what he wants you to do by playing tricks with you and grievous is one of those words uh, matter of fact it says I looked it up it's hard to bear burdensome painful distracting that word uh, uh, grievous means uh, it is causing you trouble we understand from the scripture that when God is leading you he leads you in peace he leads you in a plain path Though, again, it might be uphill, though it might be strenuous in its laborious act, but I promise you this, there'll be something on the inside of you that'll say, peace. That's the way God leads. That's the way God directs. There's been many a times I've stepped off the cliff, so to speak. I have stepped into a situation that I was not 100% sure about, but I had something on the inside of me saying, it's at peace. And I lean heavily upon this particular portion of Scripture because when I'm making decisions or I'm trying to go the will of God, I look for the grievous and I look for the peace. Why? Because grievous is indicating to us that's not God. Because notice what he said again. For this is the love of God. We, we established that this morning how God loves us. And God's not playing tricks with you. And, and if you're earnestly and sincerely seeking God, he, he, he is not going to make fun of you. He is not going to put you in a situation and say, ha, 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 that's not God. God is a loving, caring, and if you tenderly seek him and earnestly seek his face and earnestly seek his will, I promise you, according to this book and according to the experience I've had in my life with him, God will deal with you as a tender child. He will guide you in his way, and he will use this principle that I find in 1 John. The will of God is not grievous. The Outside of the will of God is grievous. Uh, the flesh is grievous. Uh, things that we get in trouble with are grievous. But the will of God is never grievous. It'll be peace. It'll be clarity. I, I pray often when I'm seeking God's direction about a certain decision, I'll say to this to the Lord and, 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 and trusting that I'm in tune with Him, Lord, I don't see all of the outside. I don't see all of what's behind the door. But I am going to proceed this way until you close the door. Until I feel the grieving of the Holy Spirit. Until I feel the grieving. And it's amazing. I'm telling you, it's amazing when you put yourself in that position as a Christian. And when you're seeking his face and seeking his will, you will just know God in his tenderness and his sweet way he does that he'll shut the door tenderly and compassionately and say no don't go that way no that's not the way and he'll use this grievous he'll use matter of fact it tells us grieve not the holy spirit and we can't explain it i cannot touch it i, I cannot put my hands on it but there's something on the inside of you uh, that when you seek his will there'll be something on the inside of you that will say and i and i trust it's the holy spirit that's giving that grieving and saying no 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 don't go that way 
Here's the plain path. Here's the peace of God. Here's the serenity of God. And it's just like a, it is so evident that he is directing that. Notice in verse number four, why is God so diligent about this? Because in verse four, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. There it is, church. Oh, I don't want to get out of the will of God. I don't want to grieve him. I don't want to go to the grievous way. But we're going to have to do it by faith. And that is what pleases God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You know what he wants you to do? He wants you to jump off a cliff, so to speak. But he wants you to listen to him as he guides you. He wants you to understand this is peace and this is grievous. He said the commandments of God is not grievous. As I traveled through this portion of Scripture, let's look at just a few more as we travel down. So I'm trying to understand how God leads me. I'm trying to understand from the Word of God how I know and not stepping out of the will of God or stepping over the will of God, but I want to be in direct uh, obedience to Him. So how do I do that? I'm looking for this grievance. I'm looking for this peace. I'm trying to find out this is grieving to me. This is uh, the Lord working, and this is God stopping me from doing this. So I'm going to back up. I'm going to pause. I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to go that way because I'm grieved about it. Here's why. Look at it with me in verse number 9. I see a phrase in verse number 9 two times that I want to bring out to you, and it's this verse. Verse number 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. We read it again, for this is the witness of God which hath testified of his Son. I hope you underline that expression, the witness of God. The witness of God is stronger and more powerful than the witness of man. I appreciate men, I appreciate the women that tell me what they're going to do and when they do it. That's a, that's a wonderful thing when people say, I did this or I'm going to do this and they do it. That's a great witness, isn't it? When they say, I'll be there at a certain time and you show up at a certain time. That's a great witness of that individual, a good testimony, if you will. But nothing in the world is like that when it comes to God. Because when he says something to you, you mark it down. When he says something to you, you can bank on it. You can, you can take it to the bank, so to speak. God's word is so much greater than man's word. God's words are greater than man's words. As we said, we know people. Uh, I remember talking to a fellow, and I mentioned this guy's name, and that man said about this man, he said, if he tells you that the sun won't come up, you might as well not get up in the morning. And I thought that's a powerful testimony that that man has just as his truthfulness. And he says, to, he said, if he tells you something, you take it to the bank. That's the gospel. Y'all heard that expression. If they tell you something, that's the gospel. Meaning, that's truth. That's exactly the way it'll be. And thank God for that. It's a day and age we live where well, that's losing. <laughs> We're losing that handshake we're losing that character we're losing that honesty we're losing that i'll do what i say i'm going to do when i say i'm going to do it and that's discouraging to people it's a it's a form of hypocrisy and you we know it i know it everybody knows has, has had been told something and uh, they're going to do something and never did it and i i, I remember uh, the Miley's. i told this story once before I had a, we had a dinner date with them. They were leaving, and they wanted to take my wife and I out, and I just did not put it in my schedule. I did not write it. I did not do it. I just didn't put it in my schedule. Well, it came along, and we missed it. Never once thought about it. The following Sunday, we saw him. I think they were going to be there the last. He said, we missed you at dinner, and I'm telling you, like a load of bricks. I said, I felt like a piece of trash. I was like, oh, brother, completely forgot. I mean, just, just, didn't, just didn't call her nothing. <laughs> and I just felt sick. I thought, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Thankfully, he showed enough grace and mercy. He gave, took us another time. <laughs> I put that one in my calendar. 
put it in my phone and made it ring a bell and made it give me a, 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 an alert. And I wanted to make sure I did not do that again. And we understand telling things that we want to do and say we're going to do and we sometimes mess up and I understand that, but not with God. Why is it not grievous? Why can you trust him? Why, when you lean on him, he's going to do what he said? I, I just can't express to you how important it is in your Christian life uh, to search for this grievous and search for this peace and find out why. Because it's true. God is going not, he's not going to be reckless with your life. He will, I promise you, he will do right by your earnest intentions. God's words are more convicting and have more authority and are clearer than man's words. Amen right there. <laughs> we understand God's words are right and God's words are true. And we base our entire eternity on the witness of God. I'm sure you've done this and I've done this. I've tested the Lord. I have Read things, in, read things in his word, and I thought, man, that's pretty strong. If I was to attach the Lord to that and sort of handcuff him to that verse, I wonder if it'd come to pass. And I tell you, I've been trying to serve him now for 25 years, and I've never put my finger on a verse and bring him on the wet carpet, so to speak, not irreverent, but you know what I mean. I, I'm sort of seeing if it's real. I've never once had him to back up from it. I've never had him once for me to put my finger on a verse in context, in its right principles, and say, God, I, you said this, and not arrogantly, but I have said to the Lord, I, this is what you said. You know why I'm going to heaven? Because I put my finger on the word of God and say, I'm going to heaven because Jesus Christ said here in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm putting my finger there, and I'm trusting that. Because I believe the witness of God, they're not grievous. I don't look at the Word of God, though I don't understand everything. I don't look at that and say, ah, a bunch of junk. No. I say everything I've read, everything I've put my name to, everything I've put my finger on, everything I've read has been true and right. Everything. Not one, not one uh, iota, not one dot, not one tittle have I found uh, uh, cor uh, corrupt. Not one dot or one tittle have I found wrong. Everything that I put my finger on and found out God is true. The witness of God is greater. It's not grievous. Why, why, am, I, why am I so adamant about that? Why? Because that's the lifeblood of the victory. Honestly, if you had a God you couldn't trust, if you had a God that you couldn't believe, if you had a God that lied to you all the time, if you had a God that just wrote something out on a piece of uh, a notebook paper somewhere and it didn't come to pass, it wouldn't be very long, you'd be adrift. Forget that. I can't trust that. I can't trust what he says. No, 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 that's not God. The witness of God is true. Look what it says back in our text. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. So how, how do we look for this grievous? The first thing I find is we must, we must have obedience to God. If you read verse number 1, verse number 2, and verse number 3, you'll find that God requires obedience. How in the world truly can you trust something you don't obey? How, how can you really truly get into something with some authority and with some conviction and with some confidence and saying, I just know this is true, when you don't even obey it? Sometime back, I had an individual that wanted to sing. And so I not interviewed him, but I did, you know, quiz him because I didn't know this individual, and I'm pretty particular about who sings. And so I quizzed him about his salvation. And he said, I, well, I don't, I'm not a believer. I said, it, it shocked me. <laughs> it completely shocked me. I said, I'm glad I asked. Yeah. I said, so you would expect me to allow you to 
get up and sing a gospel song or something that would be reverence to the Lord, and you don't believe? And he just jumped. I said, no way, man. Not in a million years. <laughs> I mean, how in the world could you consider uh, get up and sing about loving God or worshiping God when you don't even obey him? No. That's like tossing the keys to your car to a total stranger. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. H how you get in that mode, how you get keys to the house or how you get keys to the car, it, there's some compliance. <laughs> I remember Brother Dallas, I love his story. He told the story, it's a long testimony, but he told the story about when he got into drugs, his mom and dad kicked him out, as they should have. He says this. And he got into drugs. He was stealing from his mom and his daddy. You know how drugs do, people, and makes you rob and steal and thieve. And, and then he said as a young person, he was thieving and stealing from his own mom and daddy. So his mother and dad kicked him out, bolted the door, you can't come in. That's exactly what they should have done. But when he got saved and got his life right with God, and now he's preaching, and now he's evangelism, I love it. We was at the middle of the mountain, and he told this testimony. His mother said, I love this. His mother said, Chris, when you get to the house, I love it. He said, the key's under the mat. You know what made the difference? <laughs> he was obedient. And God is saying, oh, you want my grievous, or you want my path? Well, then you must obey you're not going to get this grievance. You're not going to get this direction through peace. You're not going to do that unless you're obeying. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. You say, well, I give a bunch of money. God says, I don't care. Well, I got nice clothes on. God says, I don't care. It does not matter what we are or who we are until we enter in to the obedience that we're supposed to. I mean, you can tell God all day long that I want direction and guidance for my life, but if you're not obeying his word, guess what? You got earplugs in. Though I harbor iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. You can't expect God to guide you and lead you when he knows full well we're not even obeying him. Obedience is so critical. One man said, the real issue of our life is not knowing the truth. It's not even hearing the truth, but obeying the truth. That's where we're at today, Christian. That's where we're at, church member. That's where we're at today. Oh, I know the truth. I hear the truth. I get preached the truth. I read the truth, and I see the truth, and I, I mean, on every turn. But are you obeying the truth? Well, that's for them. That's for the preacher. That's for the choir leader. That's for the song director. That's for the Sunday school teacher. No, that's for the Christian. If we want God to guide us, we must obey him. I mean, you, any parent alive that has a disrespective child or disruptive child, and you're going to give them? No. We all understand how that works. But you got a child that's obedient. You got a child that's, you know, striving to uh, to be a part of the family and and do right and 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 pull their weight. And uh, what do you need? Help you do anything you want. Hey, let's not. I'll give you some great advice. Oh, let's not do that. It takes obedience. Notice he said the first level of obedience is believing. Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth Him. That begotteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. You know what's wrong with the, the world? You know why they're struggling? Because they're not a Christian. I'm not saying all our cares go away, but I promise you this. It's a lot easier knowing God than not knowing God. Amen. Why is the world struggling? Because they're not obedient to him. Oh, I, I run into people on a regular basis, especially the lost world, that, that, that beat and bang and strive and claw and dig and pull and tug and try to make it happen and just can't do it. You know why? Because they're not obedient. God is standing, if you will, in the backdrop. God is standing here saying, if you get in obedience, then I'd guide you and lead you with grievance and with peace. I'd guide you if you get obedient. The first step of obedience is believing. All people are God's children by creation, but not all of God's not all of people are God's creation by birth. Oh yeah, everybody's created by God, 
but they're not all born of God. That's why they struggle. Honestly, that's why I struggled before I got saved. I wasn't obedient. I wasn't in his family. I'm not going to discipline some other child, some other children. We need some on the bus from time to time. <laughs> Don't we tell you? Y'all pray for us on that bus. Man, fist fights on one side. We've got to watch that. We've got to be careful. But I'm not going to. I'm going to monitor, I'm going to try to correct, but I don't run around, I don't knock on people's doors and say, I come to correct your children. Hey, you got any children disorderly? I got a big paddle on my truck. I'm here to do it, like a vacuum salesman. <laughs> Pull a big paddle out. Why? They're not mine. They're not my children. They're not obedient to me. God's the same way. You want my guidance? Then you must obey. That's pretty simple, isn't it? The second thing I see, if we want this commandments not to be grievous, we must obey God, but we must have faith in God. We read that in verse 5, verse 4. I can't express to you how important it is for you to live by faith. Just in your daily life. What's it tell us in Hebrews 11? Looking unto Jesus. Faith is just simply believing. It's just as simple as I can put it. Simple faith is believing what God has said. That is as simple of a definition that I can give you for faith. God said it, and I believe it. One man said, I, 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 God said it, and I believe it. Well, that's great. But you must, you must live by faith. It, it, it's an essential. It's an essential. Matter of fact, they overcame by faith. He tells us in those very words. Don't you wish God would write his will in a letter and postmark it to your house? Wouldn't you like to go to your mailbox in the morning and pull an envelope open and say, Todd, I need you to do this, 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 and this. Got it, Lord. Check it out. It's on my list. I tell the kids. They got mom, uh, my wife, anybody. They got them to do, put it on the list. If you don't make it on the list, it don't make it done. God's going to give me a list. I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to have a, 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 a letter in the mail, and it's going to be to me, and God's going to give me everything I need for that day, and I can't wait to read it. He did. It's called the Bible. Faith is believing what God has said. That's why you hear me often preach so heavily on reading this book. Because when you read a verse and it says, let's read just a couple maybe. When you read one and it says, look at, I'll tell you what, I just, I just picked this one. Look what it says in chapter 4 verse 1. Here, here's a great verse in the morning. Beloved. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, I, I, I don't have a full understanding of that verse, but you know what I'm going to do in the morning? I'm going to do exactly what that says. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, but be of, if they be of God. Why? Because there are false prophets everywhere. I'm not going to swallow everything that comes on through the TV. I'm not going to swallow everything that comes through online. I'm not going to swallow everything. I'm going to try the spirits, because that's what the Bible says to do. That's faith. I just exercised faith by reading that verse. I put my finger on the verse. I said, Lord, you tell me to do this. That's what I'm going to do. I've said this many times. If, God, if I read in the Bible where God told me to get a ladder, if, it read these, if I read the Bible where it says, get a ladder, climb the Twin City Baptist Church building, and jump off, I find me a ladder. I don't read that, thank God. That, that's as elementary as I can put it. God said it, it's true. Faith in God. We must be obedient. His commandments are not grievous. They're right and they're true. I want to overcome. I'm going to be obedient and I'm going to live by faith. You know, faith, <laughs> I don't know if it sounds right, but it's, it's almost a little bit addictive. If you have ever lived by faith, we were praying for Dr. Williams 
tonight in our prayer meeting. Pray for Dr. Williams. You hear me often. He is in his mid-80s. I have heard that man tell stories that will actually make your hair stand up by faith. I love to tell a couple here just thinking about it, but he was a man of faith. I love to tell the story, and I've told it here before, but his wife and I, he and I, he and his wife had no food. And he said he got to his prayer closet, and God so said to him, go to the grocery store. So he goes to the grocery store. He said, I, this is a complete real story. Goes to the grocery store. He said, God's buying. We're going to fill up two buggies. He said, I was packing it on, two buggies. And he said, God told me to start toward the counter. Told his wife, he said, start toward the counter. She said, you start toward the counter. <laughs> he said, he started toward the counter with those two buggies. He said, he got to the restaurant. lady walked in front of him. She said, sir, God just told me to tell you to pay for all that. There's something right there. <laughs> I feel a little something on that one. Another one, he said, he went to the airport. Got off the air, uh, going to go get, got out of the car, and he took his suit jacket off and he laid it under the seat of the taxi cab. In haste to catch his plane, he gets and he runs and he get, go get the plane, go to the plane. And then he remembered his suit jacket. Here's what he did: he stopped and said, "Lord, tell that taxi driver that I left my suit coat in the seat and tell him to turn around." The man, the man that's carrying the luggage, heard him pray that. <laughs> he said, "Y'all get on the plane. I'm gonna go back." He went out toward the car, you know, where the little drop off at the airport, and stood there like this. The little, the little uh, uh, suitcase guy said, can I go with you? They were standing on the side where the suitcases are, where the cars come by, and the guy drives back and said, Dr. Williams, you've been praying. You're, I found your suit coat under the seat. <laughs> oh, I'm about ready to throw this thing. He said one day he walked into a back, back, uh, a Christian college. He said he walked into that Christian college to preach at the chapel. He said a young man was there. His shoes were nearly falling off of him. He said God told him, he said, buy that boy some shoes. God said, what? He said, what? He said, God told me to buy that boy some shoes. So he walked up to him. He said, hey, young man, I want to take you out to lunch and Took him out to lunch and bought him a pair of shoes, brand new pair of shoes. God said, buy some good ones. Don't buy them cheap ones. Bought him a brand new pair of floor shine shoes. On the way back to the college, the boy said to him, he said, Dr. Williams, my daddy had died. And he said, before he, we buried him, we were so poor, my mother pulled the shoes off his dead body. And those were the shoes I was wearing before you bought me these. He said, today's my birthday. He said, since today's my birthday, and you bought me a pair of shoes, he said, would you mind if I called you daddy the rest of the day? He said, a million dollars wouldn't have bought that for me. And he's got hundreds of stories like that. I'm telling you, when you get around faith and you start living in the realm of faith, there's nothing in the world that will take it away. You, nothing that will replace that. Nothing that will replace living in faith in God. Just reading what he says. Hey, that's what he said. I don't really understand everything. I can't really wrap my mind around that. But God's word says it. I'm going to believe it. Period. Why is that so critical? I'm going to show you the last one. I'll tell you why it's so critical that we believe that. Look what it says in verse number 13. Church, this is so important. Verse 13 says, These things, the witness of God, the leading of God, the testimony of God, these things, Look what it says, verse 13. I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. I underline this, that you may know that you have eternal life. What's God doing? God's con convincing you he is what he is. He says what he means, means what he says, because your eternity depends on it. I don't know about you. Eternity is a long time. 
I'm not playing games with my eternal soul. I'm not playing Russian roulette with my eternity. Hey, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, there's been many a time I looked in the casket and I think about eternity and I think about time, but I think about eternity. It's never going to go away. It's forever and forever and forever. We better be right. I like that little joke. I, I, one guy, we, we, just in case. <laughs> no, no. We're not playing tricks here. We're talking about eternity. We better have it nailed down. The most important thing you'll ever decide in your life is where you spend eternity. Eternity is so much longer than time. Oh, if I could express to you that, because God says what he means, and he means what he says. And he's trying to get us to live in obedience and live by faith. Why? That we might be convinced that the eternal life that we possess is the real thing. The real thing. If I didn't believe what I hold in my hand is the infallible word of God, if I didn't believe what I had uh, that was eternal work, I'd do something different. I'd find it. If I didn't have it, I'd find it. But I am convinced as... From the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, I'm holding in my hand. I possess the very words of God. Amen. And I'm trusting what he says. My eternal destiny can be grievous if you don't have it settled. What are people doing nowadays without God? Clawing and scratching and can't sleep at night and fretting and worrying honestly and and i may not be for some but the day i got saved in 1998 i have not i don't want to say doubted but i can truly honestly say that i don't fret and worry about my salvation i really don't i I'm trusting him. I've got it nailed down a mile deep. I know I've trusted Christ as my Savior. I know the change that's been in me. I know the things that's happened in my life. I got evidence. I'm not everything I should be, but I tell you what I do know. I do know if I draw my last breath today, I'll stand in the presence of Almighty God. I know that is because as I'm standing here, I have the eternal life that he promised me that you may know. I ask people from time to time, you know, well, I hope so. Listen, what I got is not a hope so. What I got is not a maybe so. What I got don't, don't happen stands. I, I got it nailed down. I know without a shadow of a doubt that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. God wants to take me out of here and you see my face in the casket. I want you to know this. God has saved this old sinner. And I'm convinced as I'm standing here that I'll be in heaven when I die. And I'm basing it completely and solely on what God has said. My eternal life is nailed down from that book. Nobody's going to shake me. Nobody's going to nobody's gonna take that from me. Nobody's going to take my eternity. I mean, they may burn my body. The scripture says, don't fear the one that can destroy the body, but fear the one that destroys the soul and the body. <laughs> He's the one I'm going to trust. That eternal life, that no so salvation, that no so. And I love verse 14. Look at this. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. I have confidence in Christ. I'm not cocky about it. I don't run around with some Christian cliche. But I have confidence that my salvation has been settled. Salvation has to be settled before you die, not after. I hope you have this no-so and it all hinges on the commandments of God. They're not grievous. Oh, yeah, I have ups and downs in my Christian life. Oh, absolutely. God deals with me and convicts me, and I fall out uh, of fellowship with him because of my own flesh. 
but I understand when they're not grievous. God's commandments are not grievous. That's such a truth we need to understand because it would cause us to live as an overcomer. Oh, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the commandments of God. Thank you that you've laid them out plainly and clearly to us. Help us to obey them as you have told us. They're not grievous. I'd ask that you would help us to obey, be obedient. Live by faith. We understand we can't please you without it being by faith. And so we trust you. Live by faith that we might know that we have eternal life. Thank you that it's not a maybe so, but it's a no so. Lord, if there's someone in this room that is not 100% sure that they know, that they know, that they know, may tonight be the night that they get it settled. May conviction set upon their heart and let them see they're lost and undone without you. In eternity so long, it's forever and ever. And ever. Help us with this. In Jesus name.